we saw the end of First Samuel 4 with remember um, all that happened I went in, I went over like superstition you know if we bring the ark of God over here oh of course you know it's God's presence it represents God's presence so you know we'll, we'll get victory and a little bit of background is uh, I probably said it before but remember the whole polytheistic worldview uh, I say that many times because we live in such a different context uh, where people are either atheists or they're they have monotheism where of course if there's a god it's just an issue of one true god but during this time the norm was polytheism and Israel was supposed to be the one nation that knows it's monotheism there's only one true god and all gods are false but um so everyone had their own gods. Every nation had their own gods, and they also had like personal idols and stuff. And usually, uh, when nations battle each other, of course their god is involved in their minds. So which god is stronger? And that's why you see this in like First Second Kings also, where when uh, Assyria or Babylon, when they start conquering nations, they attribute it to their god. Our god is more powerful than their god. You can see that. So Israel, they uh, bring the Ark of God out into the battlefield, and then that superstition is de demolished. Uh, they totally get destroyed, 30,000. 30,000 foot soldiers, they're slaughtered. And uh, the two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they're dead. And then Eli, he, Eli he's called, but the American Eli, um, Eli, he... Uh, hears the news, he pretty much faints, he falls back where he dies. And then we see the uh, one of the daughters-in-law, she's having a baby that very day, and she hears the news and, um, you know, and unfortunately, uh, I think today it's, I mean, it'll depend on what region in the world, but in places like, you know, America, I'm sure it's extremely, extremely rare, uh, where, um, a uh, mom is having a baby and, and dies in the midst. Uh, but um, back in these times, it was common. Do you recall anyone else who was having a baby and died? I believe it was Jacob's wife, or second wife, Rachel. Yep, yep. Who died when giving birth to Benjamin. Yep, you're, you're exactly right, yeah. Um, I'm impressed, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so... During this time, you know, it's kind of understandable, the whole thing of uh, having a child, all that goes on. Yeah, she dies while giving birth, names the baby Ichabod, the glory of God has departed, no glory. And now, this is pretty important, this thing of glory, because, so the Ark of God, the presence of God, it's taken away, it's stolen by these pagans. So that's disastrous. Now, I don't know exactly what they would have had in their minds according to their worldview, but they would have had in mind probably at least a lot of the Israelites thinking our God got defeated maybe, and um, our God got captured in a way. Now, he, now for us, we know that he, Yahweh is the one true God in the universe, and it's not like he got captured, he got defeated. But with their worldview in this bubble, in this context, with all the polytheism that Israel was influenced by also. And later on, we may even see uh, Samuel telling the Israelites to get rid of their idols. And I think it's Ezekiel 20, where there's a whole chapter where, like, it goes into the history of idolatry. How idolatry was norm all throughout most of Israel's history, even though they're, they're not supposed to have it. But uh, the Ark of God is taken away. And the Ark of God, the presence of God, it's, it's tied to the glory of God. And that's why in 421, she named him Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. So there's a whole history, there's a whole thing on the glory of God. That's a whole topic. <laughs> but basically, the glory of God is tied to the presence of God. And since the presence of God, the Ark, was taken away, she says the glory of God has departed from Israel. Chapter 5, Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. I know it's a whole American Dagon usually, but just Dagon is fine, it's better. 
And when the people of Ashdod rose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of Yahweh. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. Okay, as I just said earlier, when you know the, the background with the polytheism and stuff, their main god, the Philistines' main god is Dagon. And basically, our god Dagon was more powerful than their god Yahweh. And that's why we won the battle and the very presence of God was captured in their minds. And so we're going to set this defeated God Yahweh, his ark. We're going to set it. We're going to bring it into the house of Dagon. You see verse 2 in that temple. And we're going to set it next to Dagon. So it's as though in their minds, this Yahweh God is like imprisoned. Remember, he's captured. He's imprisoned. And he's like, like a... Um, you know, many times when you lose war, you become a slave to the other nation. He's captured. He's uh, like subordinate to our god, Dagon. But then verse 3, when they woke up the next day, Dagon, that whole uh, idol, that whole statue idol thing, it had fallen on its face to the earth before the Ark of Yahweh. So... God likes to do things this way, where he had this uh, statue, probably, of Dagon, this god, lowercase g. It was flat on its face before the Ark of God. So, uh, now, of course, who would have done this? Because there would be no Philistine, no priest of, the, you know, Philistines, among the Philistines. No Philistine would do anything like this, right? And it's not like some Israelite would have secretly come into their territory and then like done this. Of course, God did it. And so, yeah, they um, took Dagon um, and set it in its place again. <laughs> and then when they rose early the next morning, there was Dagon <laughs> falling on its face to the ground before the Ark of Yahweh. But this, this time, the head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. So it's even more humiliating. And God, again, likes to play around like this um, to show his superiority. Uh, when it comes to the head and hands, so, you know, many times um, we, we, we've we never been in a war context for the most part. I don't think any of us. I know there there's some here that's interested in the war zone and army and military stuff. But uh, many times when you defeat the other army, you, you cut off their heads. You get beheaded. You know, that that's very common. We, we know of that beheading. And then many times also when they defeat the other army, they cut off their hands uh, so that they can't fight anymore. And just, uh, yeah, many times that happens. And so, yeah, uh, this is very embarrassing. The head and the palms of the hands of Dagon, they're broken off. Only Dagon's uh, torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house step on the threshold of Dagon in Ash to, to this day. So since this time, it's become like a tradition where they don't do this based on what happened here. Uh, but six, the hand of Yahweh was heavy on the people of Ashdod and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, the Ark of God of Israel must not remain with us. For his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. So God is letting them know, you mess with me, this is what's going to happen. So, you know, it says in verse 6, like the hand of Yahweh was heavy on the people of Ashdod. He ravaged them and struck them with tumors. So this kind of stuff goes on. Basically, the, uh, pestilence. God sometimes, you know, as punishment, he strikes with things like this. Well, he's letting them know, this is what you're going to get when you uh, mess with me. And then eight, therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So there's Ashdod, there's Gath, and there's uh, Ekron. They're like, a, I think it was five like territories for the Philistines. It's five or six, but I think it's five. And uh, many times they're all like listed, but um, they're moving it to different regions. So it's kind of a dilemma because 
on the one hand, they capture this whole presence of God thing of another country. And like we captured it, you know, we imprisoned it. But then when that region has that, they're struck with plagues. So it's like, what are we going to do? And so they send it away, move it to Gath. So they carry the Ark of God of Israel away, verse 9. So it was, after they had carried it away, that the hand of Yahweh was against the city and with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, with tumors, and tumors broke out on them. Yeah, so uh, 10, therefore they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. So it was, as the Ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, they have brought the Ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So it would have been the case where they probably would have wanted this Ark of God, because like, uh, you know, the whole thing of, yeah, we defeated the, that other God, the other country, and it's a symbol, we have it, yay, it's our treasure. But it's come to this place where they don't want it. You know, you take it, you take it, you take it. It's like that. Uh, 11. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go back to its place so that it does not kill us and our people. So uh, for... There was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very great, or excuse me, very heavy there. And the men who did not die were uh, stricken with the tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So it's become scary and bad where many died and many are struck with tumors. And so they know, yeah, this God is, um, see, it's this irony of we defeated them. We kind of defeated their God, but then... This ark is here, and whatever city has this ark, they experience this disaster, this horrendous dying and tumors and stuff. So like chapter 6, now the ark of Yahweh was in the country of the Philistines seven months, and the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners saying, what shall we do with the ark of Yahweh? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, don't send it empty. But by all means, return him with a trespass or guilt offering. Then you'll be healed and it'll be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, what is a trespass offering with or which we shall return to, to him? And they answered, five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and all, on all your lords. Therefore, you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravaged the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Look at that. I have that highlighted. You shall give glory to the God of Israel. There has to be this uh, plain recognition that yeah, that God is uh, he's something. Um, perhaps he will lighten his hand from you and from your gods and from your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts uh, when he did mighty things among them? Did they not let? Did they not let the people go that they might depart? Uh, now, therefore, make a new cart and make a take two milk cows which have never been yoked and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Then take the ark of Yahweh and set it on the cart and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by its side. Then send it away and let it go. And watch, if it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then uh, he, that God Yahweh, has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. So, real quick, uh, verse 2, who, who are the people that are giving this like advice or instruction? Verse 2 tells us the priests and the diviners. So, I don't know exactly uh, what the diviners are, but I, I just do know that, you know how there are like mediums, there are um, diviners, there are like sorcerers, etc. So we know that the supernatural is real, and we know that there's a demonic side. We know that Satan is real. And even with the Egyptians, if you remember, when Moses took the staff and he threw it on the ground and turned it to a snake, when God did it supernaturally, they had their, um, what do you call those? Uh, they had their like sorcerers and people who did the same thing, who threw down like a wooden staff or whatever, and it turned into a snake. So the supernatural is real on God's side and the evil side, Satan's side. And uh, I know just from my Korean background, I'm sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure China would have it too and other, other countries, uh, 
Asia and but also in the Western world, all over the world. Uh, I, I know in Africa and all over the world, there are these kinds of people that uh, are involved in the supernatural. More recently in history, uh, through uh, stuff like Harry Potter, Satan has really advanced like the witchcraft kind of like sorcery kind of stuff by using little kids, cute little kids, and uh, getting it really more accepted and widespread uh, among people. By, you know, normally pr prior to Harry Potter, witchcraft and, you know, those kinds of things, it was always associated with the dark side, right? Like witches, I mean, when, you, when I say witches, what kind of image comes to your mind? Do you picture like little cute little kids? No. You picture like demonic looking, like dark, you know, that kind of thing. It's always negative. But Satan has used Harry Potter, stuff like that, to get sorcery and that kind of abominable things to God pretty widespread. That's his strategy. And he, he's very successful. He was very successful through that. But um, God is uh, very serious about this witchcrafty uh, sorcery type of stuff. According to the law in Israel, they're supposed to be killed. Like it was execution if anyone's involved in any of this kind of stuff. But yeah, these pagan nations, they have these diviners and, you know, things like this. And they many times they, they uh, communicate through the demonic side. I'm sorry, I'm kind of going into this a little bit, but um, there are uh, people you pay them money and they supposedly connect you to like people that are already dead. I forget what you call them. Are they mediums? But um, what, what's very uh, ironic is. On the one hand, these atheists and unbelievers, they reject God. They say there is no God and there is no supernatural. We evolve from fishes. But then on the other hand, they know that these, um, you know, Ouija boards and this mediums and all this, like they know that this is real stuff. So it's pretty contradictory. So when God comes up, right away they, they go with evolution. They bring up evolution. And it's all natural, natural, there's no supernatural. Oh, Jesus rising from the dead, virgin, oh, that's all baloney, that's all fairy tale. But then, on the other hand, they're like Ouija board and all this stuff. So they're very, very contradictory. But um, yeah, so this supernatural thing, uh, it's real. And uh, they're giving the advice to, verse 7, make a new cart and take two milk cows, which have never been yoked. So... I, I may have explained the yoking before, but you may already know, but, you know, yoking, you usually yoke two animals and uh, you just, you bind two, uh, you know, animals together. And so you're taking two milk cows and you tie them like on the backside you, you, with like a wooden thing and you have them kind of march together. Now, if you take two milk cows, uh, I don't think milk cows are usually yoked, but um, they're going to be yoking two milk cows that have never been yoked together and then you're gonna tie the milks to the cart that has the ark of the covenant and then so milk cows uh, you know fe female they have their calves and as you know with how god created all animals us and all animals whenever mothers whether like birds or different animals when you mess with their babies most animals, they go wild, as we probably know. They'll do anything to protect their little babies. Well, they're taking their calves away from them, verse 7. And then verse 8, they're taking the Ark of Yahweh, this weird object looking thing to the cows. They're attaching it, tying it to them. And then um, put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by his side, and then sending it away, and then let it go. Verse 9, and then watch carefully, watch. If these two milk cows that are yoked, if it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, okay, so what does it mean when it says going back to its own territory? It's talking about the ark, because remember, the ark is the presence of God that belongs to Israel, Yahweh is Israel's God? Well, that ark, it's going back to its own territory, Israel. It's heading in that direction to Beth Shemesh because Beth Shemesh, this was the, like the uh, border between uh, Philistia and Israel. 
So Philistia and Israel were like next to each other. And Beth Shemesh is like the border borderline that area. So it's basically heading towards Israel. So if these two milk cows end up going in that direction somehow, then we'll know that we'll know that uh that God, Yahweh, he has done us this great harm. But if not, then we'll know that it's it's not his hand, it's not that God that struck us, but it was just by chance. So look at this. When when it, when you look at all the uh all the elements and everything that's involved in this, the whole milk cow thing that's been never been yoked, you took the calves away from them. So normally two cows in this kind of situation, they're gonna hard they're gonna have a hard time even traveling together. But also, it's going to tend to what? Want to go back home with to the calves, their own babies. That's the normal cow. But somehow, if the these cows end up going directly in that direction of Israel, obviously, that's just, that can't be by chance. That's just absolutely like, um, it's almost impossible. So basically, if that impossible happens, we'll know that it, it's God. It's that God that really did it. So look at what happens, verse 10. Then the men did this, all this. They took the two milk cows and hitched them to the cart, shut up their calves at home, and they set the ark of Yahweh to the, on the cart in the chest of the gold rats in the image of the tumors. Verse 12. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, mooing as they went, and they did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. This is really uh, like funny if you know what's going on, because like I said, the, the chance of something like this happening, it's like zero. How can these milk cows, when their babies are home, go in this exact direction? And also uh, it's uphill. That's what these cows did. So God's sovereignty is overriding the natural of these cows. So God has it this way. Basically letting the Philistines know, yeah, I was behind it, guys. You mess with my ark, my presence. I bring this disaster on you guys. It was me. And he's just like kind of just like announcing it to them. So, uh, yeah, the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. And, um, yeah, a clear message was given to them. 13. You now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. I mean, somehow the ark of God, it's like coming back home with cows. So they're, they're amazed because it's been, what, seven months since they lost the ark. But it's, it's naturally just coming back. They would have thought, oh man, we're never going to get the ark back because they were, they're weaker than the Philistines. But yeah, 14, then the ark came into the field of Joshua of uh, Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there and they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to Yahweh. The Levites took down the ark of Yahweh and the chest that was with it, in which there was articles of gold and put them on the large stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to Yahweh. So when the five lords of the Philistines, so the fact that it says five lords, like I said earlier, five kind of territories, regions of the Philistines. They had like five major kind of cities, whatever. Five lords of the Philistines had seen it. They returned to Ekron the same day. So they got their message. Hmm, okay. Yahweh God, we got your message. Uh, that Those cows um, going straight towards Israel like that. We know that that's impossible, naturally. They got the message. 17. These are the golden tumors which uh, the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to Yahweh. One for Ashdod. Here's the list. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Eshkelon, Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden rats according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel, on which they set the Ark of Yahweh, uh, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. Then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the Ark of Yahweh. He struck, okay, my text says uh, 50,070 men, but just make it to make it simple, um, according to the manuscript evidence and things like that, it seems like the 50,000 is a kind of a, either a misspelling or some error. And based on the reasoning and stuff like that, because in this region, it's a small area, there wouldn't have been 50,000 people. So this is probably uh, just 70 men, 70 men of the people that they uh, were struck, they got killed. 
uh, because they looked into the Ark of Yahweh, and um, and people, the people lamented because Yahweh had struck the people with a great slaughter. So you're reminded that uh, just because you are of Israel, you belong to God's people, it doesn't make it so that you can kind of flippantly, you know, without reverence, just look into the Ark and things like that. If you remember the law in Numbers, only the priests minister in the temple and only the high priest once a year goes where the Ark of God is. And even the Levites who help out with the ministering, they never even see these objects. Like if you read Numbers, I don't know if it's chapter 3, 4 around there, the priests make sure they cover all these objects, these holy objects, so that they can't even see it. The Levites can't even see it. So when you have that kind of background, you know that these are sacred things. You're very, very careful. And of course, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter, I think, 5 or 6, uh, is it 6? Where, remember when David is rejoicing that the Ark of God is coming to the city? And um, one of the men, uh, Uzzah, because the Ark of God was it stumbled on the cart, he reached out his hand to stabilize it, like to make sure it doesn't fall, and he gets killed. Many t uh, people will usually think, including Christians will think, man, that's harsh. But you have to understand, if you know how sacred these things are, how seriously God regards it, you'll know that that's just the fitting response. So we need to come to a place where we understand God's presence correctly. Remember God told Moses, take off, take off your sandals off your feet because the place where you stand is holy ground. Just because God's presence was there, the same thing with Joshua. Just there's so many things I can go into. Example, Isaiah 6. Uh, so when it comes to the presence of God, it's the most um, what, what solemn, uh, like reverential, uh, holy presence. So the fact that these people, they just flippantly just like looked into it, you know, because it would have been kind of intriguing. Oh, this is cool. Like um, the Ark of God, the thing that we've only heard about. Oh, look at it. And just flippantly just looking into it and stuff. They're killed. Many men are killed. So yeah, verse 20. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy God Yahweh? And to whom shall it go up from us? So they recognize, man, this is a holy object and we need to be careful and what should we do where should it go so 21 they sent messengers to the inhabitants of uh, kirjath jerim saying the philistines have brought back the ark of yahweh come down and take it up uh, with you then the men of kirjath jerim came and took the ark of yahweh and brought it to the house of abinadab on the hill and consecrated eliezer the, his son to keep the ark of yahweh so they end up sending it to this region where he's a priest He's a, he's a member of the priestly family, so that's that. Uh, any questions, thoughts?